Hello and welcome to Sophie and Co. Me, Sophie Shevard Natsa. NSA spying on millions of phones, including those of 35 world leaders, has been called unacceptable by some of America's closest allies. That says even more leaks are expected to surface, released by Edward Snowden before he went into hiding in Russia. What drives the governments in their actions? Can societies do without them? Today, we're talking to an anarchist. As governments struggle to make decisions and find solutions, leaks reveal they don't often practice what they preach. Representatives of the people, do they really care for the common good? Do they really value improving the life of the public? Or would the people be better off without the power hungry? Our guest today is Jeff Monson, American mixed martial arts fighter and a self-proclaimed anarchist. Jeff, it's great to have you in the studio today. Thanks for having me, Sophie. So I want to start with the latest NSA leaks and uh, about the fact that everyone found out U.S. was spying on everybody, including their closest allies like Germany, France, 35 countries altogether. What do you think they were looking for there? Uh, I think, you know, it's just a power. Um, I mean, I think as a general citizen of the United States, um, you know, informed, I realize that the United States is, is spying on everyone. Why wouldn't they? Because it's a, you know, a power struggle. They want to, it, it's about economics and, you know, where Germany's going to put their money, where, you know, companies are going here, where companies are going there. Um, so it's not, I don't think it's about, you know, military, how we have the old Cold War thinking like, oh, they're going to bomb us or we're going to bomb them or where they put in their submarines. I think it's more of um, economic. Um, that are involved in the spying. Mm -hmm. So what happened right after the leaks is that the countries that were spied on came on and said it's outrageous. But that's about it. Do you think they should do something more than just say it's outrageous about them being spied on? You know, I think they're spying as well. I think it's, um, you know, this is my opinion. I'm not a conspiracy theorist or anything like that. I just think these countries are constantly, you know, vying for power in certain regions. And, um, you know, they might call the United States their friend. And, and um, economically, they are friends and trading partners. But, um, you know, if you're looking for an advantage, um, you're going to take any advantage you can get when you're um, in the world of capitalism and trying to, you know, support your companies. So you think all sides are being kind of sly? Yeah, of course. You know, um, I grew up in America. I think it's a great country. But um, do you believe that America is exceptional? Do you believe in American exceptionalism in, in, in a sense that it can do whatever it wants, whenever it wants, to whomever it wants? Well, that's a very good question. I, um, um, I, I believe before, you know, American if you said you're uh, talked about American exceptionalism, people in America would say, no, 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 we're not like this. We're out for freedom and democracy, and you know we have to be involved in certain wars or have military presence in certain areas because we're looking out for the world as a whole, not just America. But now that's changed. The climate's changed, <clears throat> and to say you're, you know, especially in the Republican side of the the sphere, um, if you don't say you're except a, a, a American exceptionalism. Um, it's seen as a down thing, and they're actually criticizing Obama for, you know, for not having American sexualism. Well, it was actually President Obama that said in his speech and he spoke about the American exceptionalism. That's where I got it from, actually. Yeah, well, they're criticizing him for not being American enough and looking out for American interests enough and, and thinking globally. And, um, you know, especially Republicans, not to just bash on them, because this is kind of a universal thing in the United States now, is that we have this, you know, going back to the 1800s, this manifest destiny idea, but now it's not just North America. It's it's the world, you know. We have not only do we have to police the world, but um, you know, I, I just saw a thing. We have a military base, uh, some sort of base, and 135 out of the 190 uh, UN registered countries. I mean, <laughs> that that's crazy. And most of these countries, of course, are our friends, um, at least economically. So you know, why? Why, why do we need so many bases worldwide? Um, we're an empire, and, and to say we're not is, is not true. So, so you're saying Republicans are more keen on emphasizing an American exceptionalism, and they actually blame Obama for not being American enough. What yeah. do you think? Is he not American enough? 
Um, I, I believe that, you know, to be an American like these days, that you, you have, um, I think it's just, you have that, that pride, you know, not, not so much a nationalistic pride, but like a worldwide pride. Like we, um, you know, we're in the United States, not just a, a world power, we are the world power. And, and what we say goes, and, um, you know, religiously, economically, morally, um, we believe that we're correct and that, you know, the world should abide by kind of the rules and the standards that we set. But do you believe that the world actually needs uh, a role model, someone who could police it in some sort, or, or everyone should do their own thing? Well, my mom used to say, like, um, you know, if you say something, you got to walk. If you walk the walk, you got to talk. Or talk the talk, you got to walk the walk. Um, everything that we say, we don't do. You know, we have a illegal base in Guantanamo. We have, you know, the UN said, don't invade Iraq. Um, we invade Iraq anyway. Um, so we we do what we want to do, um, and like I said, that's where American exceptionalism comes into full play, is that we're going to do um, the things that make the United States better or make our corporations in a better situation in the world economy, and that's just the way it is. And, and if that happens to agree with other countries, that's just frosting on the cake, but if it doesn't, it's not going to stop us from doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that you actually advocate uh, health care as a affordable health care yeah. as a basic need for every human being. Of course. Obamacare is about that, affordable health care, no? Do you like the whole concept of Obamacare? Mm, yeah, Obamacare, is, um, it's got some good points and bad points. What, what was originally attended has been torn down and shredded and, and cut and pasted. And, and what we have now is nothing what um, you know, I envision for you know healthcare for you know, everybody. But it's better than nothing, no? Yeah, it's better than nothing. But unfortunately, what you have is people, businesses are actually cutting, um, you know, the hours of employees or changing benefits or um, firing people totally so they don't have to pay for healthcare. So it's actually hurting just as many people as it's helping. And another thing is. Um, physically being required to have health insurance um, under the administration of the government telling you if you don't have insurance we're going to fine you. It's illegal not to have insurance. That's you know taking away some civil liberties as well. So, Jeff, I want to talk a little bit about your views in a global sense because I know you're a self-proclaimed anarchist like we've said in the beginning but your type of anarchy is sort of justice for all and you don't like governments. You believe that people should govern themselves but um, who would we provide providing the justice? You know, people people can provide their own justice. People in, in groups and in communes and um, togetherness, you know, if you want to be part of society, there's no requirement to be part of society other than participating. If you want to participate, then you need to work and you need to abide by the rules that we as a whole agree on. Hey, we can't go murdering each other. We can't go taking from each other. But look at crimes. They estimate over 90% of crimes are economically related anyway. So imagine a society where you take out over 90% of the crimes or the need for these crimes. That I can live with, you know, having to, you know, make some alterations or changes um, in order to live with other people, knowing that most of the crime is being taken away yeah. and we're living together. But, you know, what you call economic crise, crimes um, in prehistoric times would be like uh, crimes for survival, you know, right. fight for survival. They, they didn't have money then, but they were fighting for food or to survive. So the human nature hasn't changed. You can take the economic crimes away, but for someone to actually be self-governed, it would take a lot of discipline and responsibility. And do you really believe that human beings are ready for that? I mean, do you actually have an example, a historic example, where humans were able to govern themselves without a leader? I mean, the Midwest Native Americans, um, you know, they had chiefs, but there was no written law. There was no, like, government. There was no, it was, they had these rules that they decided amongst themselves, but they were really unsaid and unwritten rules. And to live in that society, you follow these rules. And it, the um, shame you would feel by disrespecting one of the rules or someone else in society was enough to, to govern the own people. Right now, you know, you talked about prehistoric times. The most important social instinct we have is like working together because if you you know, try to take meat for yourself or 
work on yourself, say, hey, I'm going to take this and I'm going to go do my own thing, uh, forget about you guys, you're going to die in a day or two because you needed other people in your group to, to cook, to watch out for other animals or other people or, you know, help you hunt. You couldn't do it on your own. So that cohesiveness, that, that socialism, so to speak, I think is a stronger instinct than the individual, you know, greed that um, many socialism, people say. Socialism, yes, but socialists have a leader. All I'm saying is that I, 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 it does seem a bit utopian taking our times of technology and internet and the amount of opportunities and options that human beings are being offered that they would actually go back like the Indians and self-govern themselves without actually because each individual wants something more or something different so it would be so much more harder for people to self-govern themselves well I see that's what I think we were so um, you know we go back to that quote that we were talking about earlier is um, you know show these people that we need that they need us you know that was the quote from V for Vendetta you know when the leader was you know, everyone's kind of going crazy and he said show you know so they you know like talked about on the news all these crises and all this stuff that you need government otherwise the world's gonna go crazy but we do we do all the work we build the roads we teach our children we are we work in the hospitals we do all the physical labor they just sit there and say do this do this as they collect the money or work with the banks charging us interest keeping us in debt um, we we do govern ourselves in, in a sense we do all the work and we just are led to believe that we need them in order to survive but really if they disappeared now, of course, there would be some change in management, but you have to change the economic climate. Of course, if we're in a, um, a capitalistic world where, you, you know, we're fighting for each other for the basics of, of, of life, of course, there's going to be, you're going to need some, you know, one looking over saying you need to do this, you need to do this. But if you take away capitalism and there's going to be more freedom for people right now, I don't think freedom is working 40, 50, 60 hours a week trying to make ends meet, trying to pay off the bank, trying to pay a loan, trying to like survive. I think freedom is because you're working for someone else. I think a freedom is choosing what you want to do for your life, working this job, having free time with your kids, having free time for yourself. Um, I'm lucky in what I do. I, I, get, I get more free time and I get to fight and I get to spend time with my family, but I'm still working for somebody and I know this, you know, they're making profit off me and, and I feel, um, you know, I just feel for those people that are really in a bad situation. Time for a short break now, but when we return with Jeff Monson, world-class fighter and activist, we'll discuss what it takes to challenge global corporations. Stay with us. Welcome back to the show. We're here with Jeff Monson, MMA fighter and self-proclaimed anarchist. Good to have you back. All right, so you're saying you don't like conspiracies, and yet you're saying that governments are actually governed by corporations. But that's a conspiracy theory in itself. No, I, I really don't believe so because um, the banks really own the United States. The Federal Reserve, um, which is a misnomer because it has nothing to do with federal, um, is an institution of private banks owned by um, elite individuals who loan money to the United States um, for all the federal spending that we do and we have to pay that back to citizens have to pay all that money back with interest so um, if you took all the American money and put it in a, a big warehouse it would only account for about four or five percent of all the American money that exists because if they loan a billion dollars to the government then that has to be paid back with interest but where does that interest come from it doesn't exist it's just a theory what, Jeff, wasn't it always like that it's not like something that just happened overnight I mean even like a couple of centuries ago, obviously governments were financed or lobbied by rich people. Yeah, well, 1913, um, um, after a lot of bank foreclosures and, or bank closures and um, a lot of economic crisis in the United States, um, the Federal Reserve was, was, Act was, was formed and um, the United States has been a, a, under a prison ever since and we will always be in debt there's no way if we paid back everything we owe with all the money all our resources that we have we would still be 95 96 percent 
owing what we still owe right now in debt, and it will always be that way unless we change the system. You know, talking about debt, the fear of what will happen to the U.S. debt actually holds countries around the world hostage because they're so heavily dependent on U.S. currency, on U.S. dollar. Do you think there could be some sort of um, opposition to that, to, to the debt ceiling being raised all the time? Well, of course, it, what happens in the United States with, um, you know, on Wall Street or with our corporations affects the world economy and, and, you know, it vibrates worldwide, you know, something happens in the United States, but it's really controlled by the corporations and banks. But and what it, can other countries do about that? Can they resist? The they can't somehow? because they're the United States. Like I said, the United States is an empire. We have um, some trade or some tariffs enacted upon them, or some um, sort of deal. Our, you know, corporations are going into their countries, and, and or vice versa. Um, you know, exchange. You know, we're having free exchange of you know economic ideals, and nothing until the system is changed. These are always going to be conflicts. You know, people talk about the rise and fall of, you know, um, the how the money currency is going or you know the economy we're in a recession now now we're out of the recession it's just it's something that everything will be under control we just got to ride the wave it will never the wave will never be smooth under capitalism and people need to realize this but you talk about the change of system and you know i guess in a way about beating the corporations but you are a MMA fighter you yeah. out of all people you know what it takes to defeat someone so you need to be equally strong mm. uh, so if corporations are owned uh, if governments are owned by corporations obviously the governments can't defeat the corporations so who can who could stand up to corporations well the government is in with the corporations so they definitely don't want to overcome so them. who can actually the people. stand up and it, it would take an enormous amount of education and the internet has actually been fantastic in this way look at some of the um, situations we've had like in Libya and Egypt that that was really made possible by the internet and 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 people being on their cell phones actually and even occupy Wall Street and so people are becoming more knowledgeable and they're and they're realizing that they connect with other people some businessman from Manhattan is realizing you know what I have something in common with this farmer from Kansas and and they can connect and, and see each other's you know their social contacts but um, it would take an enormous amount of education as I say and, and the people the people could shut this down in one day if there was a general strike world general strike the corporations and banks would be at the mercy of the people the 99.9% .9 of people who do all the labor do you really believe that could ever happen that would take i said an enormous amount of effort and and do would that happen in my lifetime um, you know, I can only hope, but um, that's why I like to, you know, we're talking now and it's about educating. Well, talking about education and internet access, um, I had a guest uh, recently on Sophie and Cohen. He actually said that American nation is the best entertained nation, but the least educated, the least informed, nevertheless. Yeah. Why is that? Is it because of the media or just people can't be bothered and they're too lazy to know more? Well, I think they, they made whoever this guy made a very good point, but they go hand in hand. When you're entertained by watching, you know, I'm a big, or a, you know guilty of this as well. I'm watching a football game on TV, then I'm I'm not learning about my own situation. You know, why am I not can't pay the rent this month, or why can't I this, or or fighting for some injustice? Um, you know, we have all these TV reality shows and what the Kardashians are doing and some, you know, crazy this, crazy that. Um, and we're entertained, but it keeps us, they like that. The, not only does the media like that, the government likes that, the banks like that, because it's hard to protest okay. when you don't realize what's going on and when you're kind of happy just watching your show at the end of the night and relaxing. I'm going to read out your quote. Um, your quote from Twitter. We tolerate and often empower those who exploit, subjugate, coerce, oppress and enslave us, yet look upon those asking for a handout in disdain. Have you thought about the human nature? Why is that that we're that way? I think that, again, that's the media, that's the culture we have. When we see someone on the side of the street asking for, you know, a dollar or something, you know, to, to get by, to get a, you know, a piece of bread or something like that, we're like, we immediately think, well, they haven't, they're not working or they're not, they're Are you lazy. talking about American culture in particular? Because I don't think every country around the world is the same way. I, I, I think this is American culture, specifically. Mm -hmm. um, 
that we we're talking about you know the American dream if you work hard enough in America you can be the president you can be a superstar you can um, own a company you just have to work hard enough if you don't um, then you're on the side of the street asking for bread and, and people are gonna look at you and, and turn away but if you work hard enough then you can have these things but that that's not true you know they did a recent study on industrialized countries and the United States was number 16 in social mobility so the American dream that if you just fight f for what you want and, and work hard enough that you can achieve it that's not true if you grow up in the inner city and and don't have the resources and can't get the education so when you grow up you're not prepared for the world you're you're at a disadvantage so you don't no matter how hard you work if you don't have these tools and help growing up you're never going to be able to achieve what you want mm -hmm. now you because of your profession you travel travel around the world have you noticed how america's image has changed uh, throughout maybe two, three years in the past, in light of Syria, in light of Libya, in, in light of NSA leaks. Have you noticed a shift in this image? Um, you know, I think we had under Bush, we were kind of referring to this earlier, we had a really bad view um, uh, in, in the world. Um, and now it's, I think that view softened a little bit and, and people, I think, and generally think of the United States as um, kind of bloated and lazy and and um, kind of get what we want in the entertainment, you know, industrial capital of the yeah, world. Yeah, I mean, Libya, Syria, and uh, NSA leaks, they really happened under Obama. Yeah, but I think people under, like, Obama, like I said, they have more, they think we're, like, spying on the world, but we're not as, um, even though it's not true, as militaristic and, and cutthroat as, as we once were under Bush and, you know, invading this country. I think we're, um, we talked earlier about Bush saying, we're going to invade you because that's the right thing to do, and God, you know, help us do the right thing, and we're going to do it, whether you like it or not. And under Obama, it's more, uh, we're going to spy or send some drones here and we'll make some, well, accidental killing, sorry about yeah, that. You could actually see the, the, the reaction around Bush because, I mean, a lot of people did dislike him. Uh, but when he said we have to invade, he had no doubt on his face. So it was like, okay, let's do this. Yeah. And then when President Obama is like, well, we we'll probably have to bomb Syria, he did have doubts on his face. So right. soon enough, like you have Britain who backs out first, right. and then everyone else is just like, no, I think we shouldn't do it. So you could just read the doubt on his face as he was saying that America should bomb Syria. Yeah. I actually think Obama has less support among leaders as you're kind of referring to um, world, especially the, our you know, allies. Um, then I think Obama has less support than, than Bush did because of the, those reasons. But um, you know, support among like the masses of people, I think the, it hasn't, Obama doesn't have any more support or less support than them. I think it's just different. They're just seeing um, maybe some weaknesses in, in um, are well, kind of a dictatorship, or what do you want to call it? But in the leadership that he's he's showing, they're seeing the. Now, I know that you love Russia a lot, and I wonder why. Because you know, <clears throat> Russia, as great as it is, and I live in this country, has its own bunch of problems yeah. with whole scores of issues. Why uh, do you love it so much? Well, <laughs> that, I always had a fascination with Russia and, and the people, and um, you know, this is. This is where the first social, modern social revolution in the world took place, 1917, um, when people, um, even Marx didn't predict it was going to be in Russia. He thought it was going to backward Russia. How could it happen there? It's going to be in, in in Europe, you know, industrialized countries. Um, so it was a it was a great event, and um, there's a lot of, a lot of great anarchists. Um, that have come from from uh, Russia. So you love Russia because of the great anarchists. Uh, well, that's fine. But people here have treated me very well, and and um, you know when you have grown men coming off the street, men and, and hugging you, and, and like like you can feel the emotion. Is that why you want to be a Russian citizen? Because I know you're in the process of getting a Russian citizenship. Um, that's that's some of it, and um, I I'm not proud to be. I don't think. You're a citizen of a country be just because you're born there. I was born in the United States. There's no, you know, obviously no doubt. But I don't feel that it, that is my home. That's not where my heart is. That's not where um, I don't believe in. Do you not love your country? I mean, what is a country? A country is a, a piece of land and, and people. There's there's definitely people in the United States that I love, um, and I think there's a lot of great people there. But um, I don't. 
adhered by the government or um, the administration or the imperialism at all. And I'm, I'm ashamed to say, you know, on a, on a world, you know, when I travel, like, oh, I'm a United States citizen because I, it has so many connotations that go along with that. And um, I don't agree with, um, you know, the, what our government's doing. So, no, I'm not proud to be a United States citizen. Jeff, it was great to have you on this program. Thank you very much for this interview. Thank you. Sir. That's all for now, folks. Our guest was mixed martial arts fighter Jeff Monson, and I'll see you in the next edition of Sophie and Cook.